Every cell in my body is replacing itself with another And the new one is have room to change the world We've got a workshop happening here. So I'd invite you, if you're staying, to come sit near the front. S'il te plaît, viens chez nous. À plus proche, on va parler avec the Honorable Nicholas Graydon. From New Brunswick. From New Brunswick. <laughs> but we want it to be a more intimate atmosphere. On veut que c'est plus intime. Alors viens s'asseoir près du...
I wonder if we can move this table back a bit. Can I move this table back a bit, you think? Let's see you later. I'll move in it. You can get it back a little bit further. Bonjour tout le monde. Micro, s'il vous plaît. Oui. Bonjour tout le monde. Nous sommes contents que vous êtes là. Je m'appelle Geneviève Galin. Je suis directrice du développement. C'est mon privilège de vous présenter. Mon ami, Greg Nicholas, il a des lettres devant et après. Mais il aime qu'on l'appelle Greg Nicholas. Il est bien connu partout au Canada et dans les cercles catholiques. Il est la première personne à, à, autochtone à recevoir un diplôme en droit. Je vais passer à travers. Et la première personne autochtone choisie pour une cour commerciale, elle a été juge et lieutenant gouverneur pour la province du Nouveau-Brunswick, le premier autochtone. Il est chevalier de Calon, développement et paix et toute association catholique au Canada, y inclut le Conseil autochtone qui est une bonne occasion pour l'Église catholique d'en apprendre des, des Autochtones. Et il fait partie du cercle de euh, la Dame de Guadeloupe depuis quelques années. Alors, c'est un plaisir pour moi de lui souhaiter la bienvenue et de, de l'inviter à partager ses expériences, son vécu. Well, first of all, thank you very much, jean uh for that uh, introduction. And it's great to see all of you uh, gathered here in the semicircle and uh, circling behind as well, I guess. Uh, the circling behind, we in our culture, we call that where that's where the elders sit and make sure that and make sure that whoever is speaking tells the truth. 
So I'm going to be I'm going to be paying more attention to the outer circle. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. And anyway, it's wonderful to be here in, of course, Mi'kmaq territory, uh, Shibuktuk, which is the Mi'kmaq name for Halifax. And it was here actually in Halifax where the first uh, evangelization began with the baptism of Grand Chief uh, Member Two on June 24th, 1610. And that's a few years ago. Uh, but it was at this particular occasion when he agreed to become, a, I guess, a follower of Jesus because the French missionaries who came convinced him that Jesus uh, is a man of peace and convinced him also that Jesus had a grandmother named St. Anne. The reason why I bring those two things up is because from the very beginning, the evangelization that took place and took root and seeds here in the Maritimes was of good relationships with indigenous peoples and, of course, the Catholic Church that we belong to. He encouraged the uh, to learn because as Grand Chief of the Mi'kmaq, he was the leader of all Mi'kmaq people in the Atlantic area. Of course, we know the Mi'kmaq in their Grand Council have their own form of government, still do have their own form of government traditionally, their own language, their own ways of teaching, their own ways of spirituality, and their own ways of passing knowledge from one generation to the next. The Grand Chief I got to know well was Grand Chief Donald Marshall Sr. When I was in my infant stages as a lawyer uh, representing the two tribes in New Brunswick, the Mi'kmaq and the Wilistigweek, although back then they called us Maliseet. And then, of course, we had Chief from Lennox Island First Nation, Chief Sark, who decided to be part of our group. But back in the 70s and 80s, the chiefs and leaders of all the Atlantic area would meet. So that's where I got an opportunity to deal closely with Grand Chief Donald Marshall Sr. And when you're the only legal person in an organization, Everybody comes to you and say, well, look, can you help me with this? Can you help me with that? And when you're on full time, you have all kinds of clients, all kinds of issues that are brought forward that people want resolution, either through the courts or through the government agencies that exist here in the Atlantic region, as well as nationally. So it's in that kind of atmosphere then that I actually began to be taught by my elders. And when I say elders, they said, Graydon, you got all these letters behind your name. Sounds like Campbell's alphabet soup. <laughs> and he says, you've been taught well. You tell us you know a lot. However, there is something missing in your life, in your knowledge. He says, you don't know the traditional ways of our people because you were never taught at the different universities you attended, any different courses you took at university. And so, and we know you can learn. So they began then to teach me the traditional ways of our people in this part of the world. That's why I refer to this moment of June 24th, the feast, of course, of St. John the Baptist, when the first conversions took place among Grand Chief Member Two and his family and others. And because of that first wave, I call it, of evangelization, the Mi'kmaq are the only tribe, as far as I know in the world, who have a direct link with the Vatican. 
which is evidenced by the Mi'kmaq Concordant, which is the relationship then that was created by heads of government, in this case, the Mi'kmaq and representatives of the Vatican, the priests who came there. So I learned that. And I also learned, of course, a little bit more about the traditions of my own people, the Wulistagawig. And you probably read, okay, there are Mi'kmaq and Malastites and Passamaquoddies in the Atlantic area. The name Malasit, which is what was given to our tribe, was actually a name suggested by my Mi'kmaq brothers and sisters who I dealt with the earlier points of contact. They said, when you speak to Malasites, they're very, very slow speakers. So in French, Mali means sick in a way. Set is means just describes who they are. So I come from the community of very slow speakers. And uh, so we have this rivalry between the tribes. And of course, we also have our brothers and sisters of the Penobscot and Passamaquoddy who live in the western part of New Brunswick, as well as in the state of Maine. And back then, before there was European contact, we had our own confederacy called the Wabanaki Confederacy. The Wabanaki in our term means this is where the sun first rises. And so Waban means describes who we are because we're the ones who first see the sun as each day begins. And so it was an economic, political, spiritual, and cultural components uh, to one another as tribes, to get along with one another, to survive off the land, because we lived off the land. And it was the land that taught us how to survive. Our spirituality is very much embedded into our way of life because of the land and the water and all that grows in that area of what we call Mother Earth. So that's what I've been learning a lot back then. And I'm not sure how good a student I was in those areas. But if I forget something, I'm reminded by the second row. Oh, great. And by the way, so I'm glad my wife is in the first row, not in the back. <laughs> She's, uh, she and I will be celebrating our uh, major anniversary uh, this this uh, June 28th. Uh, and uh, she's put up with me all these years. And uh, we got married in 1969. So this will be our 53rd year. And uh, well, give, give her the hand because she's the one who, uh, <laughs> she's the one who has made me very mellow. And uh, because I was born definitely with many chips on my shoulder. And why? When I started the first grade in 1951, I was only five years old. And at the end of June, when you get your cards from the teachers, I got mine and I took it home. And mom says, let me see your card. I said, sure, here. She says, oh, no. I said, oh, did I bring somebody else's card or what? <laughs> she says, no, you didn't pass grade one. What had happened is I knew words, but I couldn't read. And so as a result, I said, okay. I'll have to do the Tim Horton Express try again. And so the summer of 1952, it was a difficult year for me in my community because people ridiculed me. Who feels grade one? And when your name is Graydon, great did you grade is all I heard in the summer of 1952. So as a result, when you hear that in your community, there is this big doubt 
and a big chip on your shoulder. And so as a result, I had no respect for my elders who let that particular chant, great, did you great, which affected their children. So like a six-year-old, I buried that somewhere inside of me. And that's what psychologists and social workers will say, in order to survive, you bury the pain in the recesses of your mind and body and never allow it to resurface. And so that's why I said I had a lot of chips. So eventually when I became a lawyer, I was a tough advocate against the governments because I didn't like the way they treated our people. And I said, I'm going to use whatever knowledge I get trained as a lawyer to beat the government to death. This was my revenge on government for what they did to our people. And I used that training I achieved in law as an advocate and research to do what I can to shame the government. So this is why, like I say, my wife tamed me a lot. So did my mother. But it was only in March of 1986, when I did a silent retreat in Guelph, Ontario, with the Jesuits, that I started my healing journey. In other words, my spiritual director, the good woman that she is and was, said, Graydon, there's something bothering you. I said, I don't know what it is. You haven't told me something about your life that's brought you pain. Flashbacks to 1952. So I explained to her that I was hurt when I was six years old. And she asked me, I want you to take to prayer the passage from scripture on John, in which Jesus washes the feet of his disciples and even of the one who betrayed him. I told her, you gotta be kidding. I'm not Jesus. I'm not Christ. Why should I forgive those people who hurt me? They don't deserve to be forgiven for what I suffered in 1952 and ongoing since then. She said, well, try to take it to prayer. I resisted and believe it or not, I debated with Jesus in my prayer time. And I said, look, it's easier for you to do it because this was your mission that your dad sent you on earth. But I don't have that kind of a mission. So when you toss and turn in sleep, you can't rest. I took refuge in the chapel about three o'clock that morning. And I asked Jesus to help me. I said, you're going to have to hold the basin because it will be hard for me to look in their eyes, these people. But as a result, I end up washing 300 pairs of feet between 3 o'clock in the morning till about 5.30. Had a good sleep. The next afternoon, my spiritual director says, Graydon, I want you now to have them Wash your feet in order for full forgiveness to take place. Majority of these people, of course, had died, but I did. And I would encourage them. I said, look, if Graydon can do it, you can. So come on, get it over with before the water gets too cold. <laughs> so even in prayer, you see, you have to have a sense of humor. 
to bring you a bit of humility so that you realize that you're here for a reason. The Lord created you for a purpose from that moment of conception to your daily life. So that's why I left that retreat in March of 1986 then with a renewed life where I know that no matter how bad the hurt is, there's always a way to try to bring it to fruition. So it does not kill the spirit within like it did for me for those number of years. And then it lo no longer mattered whether I won or lost in court. I would still give those talents and skills of advocacy in a political setting, in a judicial setting, or any other settings then to say, we have to have hope. This is why I like your motto, motto here, create hope. And of course, en français also, nourrir l'espoir. So your organization then creates hope, creates opportunity by having you come together into what I call a meeting of the minds and the heart and the spirit so that you think beyond self, you act beyond self because of the people you come here to represent, because of the people who are voiceless, because of the people who have no power, because of the people who are in different stages in their lives of reaching to you to help them. This is the beauty of your mission. You're 55 years old. And when I was 40, I was looking forward to Freedom 55, believe me. Especially when you're involved heavily with politics, law, and all the struggles that take place. I said, I'm looking for that sunset in the sky to retire. Well, I haven't been able to retire yet. And here I am, 76 years old. But I want to share with you that background because I think as you deal with my indigenous brothers and sisters across this great land, it's important that you sit like this together and listen, engage in dialogue, pray together for strength. Pray together for healing and forgiveness because that next step cannot be taken until and unless that happens. So that's the challenge that our Catholic community in Canada faces now. So I've been involved with the church a long, long time. I remember gathering in Toronto in 1991 at a conference. He said, how are we going to celebrate 500 years of contact? And that's like asking our people, how do we celebrate 500 years of oppression, subjugation, colonization, and inhumanity? Because you see, that's what our people suffered. And many continue to suffer now because of the role that the Catholic Church took. It was no longer what was experienced by Grand Chief Member Two in 1610 when he was told that Jesus is a man of peace. Jesus is a man of love. Jesus has a grandmother and a grandfather. But in indigenous, we celebrate the grandmother with great respect. Because the grandmothers have more patience with children. So I figure St. Anne must have been pretty patient with Jesus growing up. But that's one of the things that convinced. The other thing was these early missionaries knew they had to identify Jesus as indigenous. Otherwise, why is there a reason to follow him? As Catholics, we all know what happened with the incarnation. 
Why did Jesus become human? Basic Baltimore catechism that I was taught, <laughs> and I'm sure you all took, but more fancier words now. So they said, Jesus is Indian. Jesus is indigenized. Jesus is Megamount. Jesus is Willis Tegweeg. So he's one of us. So if he's one of us, we learn to relate to Jesus as our elder brother. And so that's how we lived at the beginning. Unfortunately and sadly, that journey took a major twist. When the leaders of the Catholic Church in Canada partnered with the federal government to create residential schools. In other words, they never asked us as Wilstowick people or Mi'kmaq people or any other indigenous people across this land would you agree to have your children removed from your arms, send them to centers of education so they can be like us? If we look at evangelization of the word, did Paul tell the Greeks, send our kids, remove them from your arms, from your culture, from your language, from your traditions? Of course, the answer is no. So why did they say that, okay, we want to colonize indigenous people? Why? Because, you see, at the very beginning, they thought we were pagans. They didn't understand our spiritual ways. They didn't know we had a culture, a language, a government, an educational system, and relationships with one another to help one another. We didn't need the Ten Commandments. We didn't need the Sermon from the Mount. Our people lived it. And we were taught that from the very beginning. And yet somehow at a certain stage, they thought our spiritual values were not good enough to be followers of Jesus. And the governments wanted our people out of the way so the development could place take place across the land so they would not be in the way of railroads or other companies so their lands could be exploited. So you'll hear a lot about this notion of discovery, the papal bulls, the documents that were there to justify that Europeans could in fact colonize our people without any fear because they had the law on their side. So can you imagine children five and six years old removing from the arms of their parents, grandparents and communities, sent to distant places, told that we want to educate your children. But the moment they got there, they were not allowed to speak their language. They were not allowed to express their culture. They were not even allowed as brothers and sisters to interact with one another. And they were held in these residential schools, sometimes 10 years, sometimes longer. Can you imagine the absence of love in the hearts and minds of those children because they were never raised in a family? So where are you going to be able to learn to be a mom and a dad? Where are you going to know you know, what to do. So when you're done, how do you deal with that pain? You suffered because of humiliation, because of abuse, because of punishment, all in the name of Jesus Christ. You can see then now, to deal with that pain, people became addicted to alcohol and later drugs. And so you have generations of indigenous children and families and communities in this country that are right now in a very difficult intergenerational problem. 
not created by us, but created by the powers to be, which is our church. I'm just, just talking Catholics here, because the Anglicans, United, Presbyterians, and some Baptists thought their God was better than our God. Even though among themselves, all these different faiths could not believe who in fact was the true God. They developed different churches and expecting our people then, well, is Jesus subdivided into all of these other groups? You can see then the confusion that occurs then in indigenous people of this land. How come? Why? And so that pain is finally surfacing now in a, what I call a grace-filled way. With the discovery of unmarked graves in British Columbia last May, it awakened the consciousness of every non-Indigenous person. How could this have happened? How could these children be buried? And there's no statistics or administrative forms to say what happened. How did they die? Their parents and families were not told that their children died. They never came home. They never knew whatever happened. And yet the selling point is, give us your children, we'll educate them, we'll teach them, we'll civilize them, and then they'll come back. Too many didn't come back. And for those that did, this intergenerational reality in our country that our indigenous people face is real. It still exists. All you have to do is look at the statistics of suicides among indigenous people, which is the highest. All you have to do is look at the highest number of addictions that indigenous people have. All you have to do is look at the statistics of the prison population, young offenders, male and female, in the prison systems. Why? You have to sell you know, why, how come? Well, it has its roots way back, way, way back, over 300 years of colonization. So when you're treated as nobody, it's just like me being ridiculed by my own community. I'll hide it, and I did. But as I confess to you, I end up being a very bitter man. It's a good thing I had a wonderful wife and beautiful wife here to help me in my recovery. I didn't go to residential school. So it's important then, as you understand what I've explained to you, and there's a lot that's been written. Now you're aware of the 94 calls to action. You're aware of the education system that the province controls does not teach anything about what I just shared with you. Universities and colleges, and I work at university. In fact, I'm chancellor of St. Thomas University now, and I teach indigenous issues. The students who come to our university, many, many do not know what I just shared with you. And who was supposed to teach them? The political science, historians, religious studies, historians, psychologists, sociologists, philosophers, social workers, and you name any profession that have, that have professions. Extremely few of them teach their students about this residential school. I can say that because in my three years at law school from 68 to 71, I only had one course that mentioned anything about Indians. Never the history of the taking land away and making them into, in a way, almost like prisoners. When I went to study for my master's in social work in Laurier back in 1972 to 74, 
there was no mention in the two years of study of, in fact, the hurt and the pain. So there's a lot of catching up to do. Now, I have no idea what professional backgrounds you have, what associations you would have in our church or government agencies or whatever you are part of. But you're involved here as well. You're involved because you're a human being. You're involved because you care for people. You're involved because you probably have brothers and sisters, children, grandchildren, maybe some great-grandchildren, who need to know what unfolded in Canada back from that date of 1610 to now. You need to know and share with them what you're hearing here today. And not just necessarily from me, there, but there are all kinds of resources. And you have to be able to go in Tim Horton's coffee shop or these uh, other fancy coffee shops and say, look, Orange Shirt Day is coming up on September 30th. What can we do? The National Indigenous Day is coming up next Tuesday. How do we celebrate then together? And then, of course, in our Catholic faith, we have the National Day of Prayer in Solidarity with Indigenous people celebrated on December 12th of each year. It's funny how it would come to this because when I got involved with the Aboriginal Council in 1998 to 2004, we sat with bishops, lay people, religious organizations, and Indigenous people. And it was a big struggle. The first thing we did was remove the table. We sat in a circle. Because you see, within a circle, mathematically, you know, every point on that circle is equal and needed. If it's out, it no longer is a circle. It's not equality anymore. And this is what was difficult for us at the very beginning to convince that we had to sit in a circle. You're listening to me, and I appreciate that. But in a circle, as each person speaks, the rest of us listen patiently and with great discipline because we can't say. We have to wait until it's our turn. And by the time it gets our turn, we forget what we're going to tell that person. But you see, you've got all these other voices that are equally important in that circle when you share. That's why our people traditionally want to sit in a circle. So they can be equal with one another. Doesn't matter age, doesn't matter gender, it doesn't matter educational or professional qualifications. A circle is equality. And it's in that circle then also we celebrate our spirituality. So I was asking John, I said, Wow, that's a great big stone. Boy, what's that for? <laughs> Does it keep me in peace or what? So in a circle, we would pass around a stone like this or a feather. Or a nice little card that was just given to me by the cardinal, this one. And we would say, okay, it's your turn to speak. Hold on to this. And that's how our people existed. That's how our spirituality. And we would always begin each circle with a prayer and close with a prayer. The gratitude to our creator. And, of course, for us, God. Now, slowly, this is coming back. So now this particular Aboriginal council that I began to be part of in 1998 and then changed title to Our Lady of Guadalupe Circle, which my friend and I here on my left sit together and others to discuss in a circular way, what can we do? It's trying then to say, okay, indigenous people are also made in likeness and image of God, the creator. Isn't what the words of Genesis, the opening chapter of Genesis tell us? God did not discriminate. God said, human beings I've created are made in the likeness and image of me. So for indigenous people, we're in the image and likeness of each and every one of you. 
We're no better, no worse. We're the same. We have our own frailties, sometimes well hidden, sometimes don't want to share, like I've shared with some of my past here today. So if from the very beginning, we were put on this place, the world by our creator and made in likeness and image of our creator. Wow, isn't that the chapter that's missing from the Bible? How come the creator gave us language different than yours? Because God wanted each and every person around the whole world to be able to communicate with one another and also to help one another. And no one language is more important than the other. No more particular part of culture is more important than the other. And so I think if you can walk away from this session saying that, geez, you know, that guy is not such a bad guy. You know, he thinks the same as me. Talks a long time. It's probably because I just came off a silent retreat. <laughs> <laughs> but can you imagine your group here, 55 years in existence, began to unite one another with the special gifts and talents that each one of you have. And the people you'll return to after the conference, when we represent to share with them what you've experienced here in Halifax. And tell them, did you know that's the place where the first baptism took place? On June 24th, 1610. Wow, who was it? Well, we learned it was Grand Chief member too. And we learned that the missionaries told the Mi'kmaq and the Willistic Week that Jesus is Mi'kmaq. Jesus is Willistic Week. Of course, we know that Jesus is Greek. Jesus is French. Jesus is all of these other people that are created around the world. So we're brothers and sisters in this great planet and in the Americas we call Mother Earth. So that's what's important then for you to continue to create hope with one another. Walk with our brothers and sisters of the indigenous communities. We can't walk alone. We need one another. And the only way we can begin to stride in freedom, equality, is together. Otherwise, we'll be leaving people behind. Otherwise, we'll be thinking that they're not good enough. They shouldn't be part of our pilgrimage. And so this path of reconciliation to me is a moment of great grace. And we study scripture. We know grace comes from God. It doesn't come from Graydon. God provides grace. Now, are we prepared as individuals to accept that grace? In silent retreat, I'll get all kinds of graces. I wasn't expecting. But it had to be in silence to listen to the word of God. Great. And, and this week, of all the different retreats I've made, I've probably made about 30 retreats. It was about memories. Memories from scriptural passages in the Bible in relation to people that I've contacted. So that's the first time I've ever experienced a retreat of that. Probably it's just a good thing it was in preparation for this. Now I know there's supposed to be Q&A, but I just want to again just say one more thing. For you. If you have read what Pope Francis said on April 1st in Rome, you'll see how his mind changed because he heard from the voices of the residential school survivors. The priests, cardinals, and bishops could not convince him to come to Canada. So it had to be indigenous people 
who were there and share with him the suffering that they had. And so the Pope, when he spoke, related a lot to indigenous values. He even referred to grandmothers. He talked about our culture and our tradition and our spirituality and almost mentioned Mother Earth. But you know, when the spoke, when the Pope, uh, Pope Francis spoke in Bolivia, he mentioned Mother Earth eight times. I read this stuff, that's how I find out. So there's great hope and expectation for him when he comes here next month. We know he's not well, he can't go everywhere. But he needs you. He needs me. He needs so many others, especially those who are suffering. Because he has to apologize and say it was wrong. This never should have happened. So how do we then as a church respond? And I'm just going to give you one example. In 1984, Pope John Paul II was a saint now, when he was in Midland, Ontario, said Christ in his own body is Indian. Christ in his own body is indigenous. How come it's taken that number of years from 1984 to now to awaken the Catholic Church or any Christian church who are followers of Jesus? How come, as I say, somebody dropped the baton in 1984? Because we never heard this from our pulpits. We never read it in any literature published by Catholic organizations. I heard him and I jumped for joy. Why? Because flashback to 1610. 1610 is when the indigenous people first heard it in this area. So how come since 1984, we don't hear this from the pulpits of our church. Is it because in the seminaries they don't teach the men who go there? Is it because for the women who go in the convents, they're not taught? You can't blame the students if the professor doesn't teach. So somebody fell asleep. Governments loved it. Governments loved it because they would retain control. The truth wouldn't come out. So this is the beauty, as I see the grace that's going to come to Canada. The Pope apologizes sincerely, but secondly, it reinforces that evangelization went amok. It went amok when the church got involved with the governments on colonizations. And colonizations is to convert forcefully people to think and be like you. That's what colonizations around the world are about. You knew that in your work around the world. So how do we restore? How do we recover? How do we rehabilitate? How do we begin a new path of reconciliation? So my good friend, I'll stop here and see if there's any time for questions. Thank you very much. Waliwan, merci beaucoup. Thank you, Graydon. So while I give a closing, I'm gonna look for somebody who can tell me how much time we have left. Zero time, that's what I thought, zero time. Um, but just to wrap up, and then we'll see what we can do. Um, thank you very much, Graydon. I appreciate it. I was at a party, my first post-pandemic party, uh, recently, and was speaking to a friend who is Algonquin. And we were talking about how um, the culture of extroverts versus introverts and how 
DNP, including myself, many of you, we're like an extroverted culture where we want to do, we want to go, we want to act, we want to move, we want to change. But the introverts are those who teach us to listen and reflect. And I have never been so struck as I've been in the last couple of years of how important it is for us to be listening. And if we want to move forward on reconciliation, that listening is. So I think for about 10 seconds, I was like, oh no, what are we going to do? We have no Q&A. Then I was like, of course we have no Q&A. Our job is to listen. So that's what we did. And I want to thank everybody for listening today and to taking that grace-filled heart uh, as we go forward to continue listening. Thank you, Graydon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for my wife. <laughs> so, Luke, what's next? Next is our, our friends are coming back from the other workshop. They're going to gather together and uh, have a moment of gathering together and a, a a community building moment before we go into lunch. So there's a slight, and we will be, when everybody gets back, we'll announce the adjustment to the agenda. We were going to eat on time. So, uh, okay, in case you didn't hear that, the whole group is going to come back together here for a few moments before lunch. Alors, si tout le monde peut venir tout ensemble dans la salle pour quelques minutes avant le lunch. Merci.